Good afternoon, and welcome to our symposium on the changing landscape of higher education. I'm Deborah Floyd, and as professor and program leader of the Higher Education Leadership Program, which is one of the concentration areas in the Department of Educational Leadership and Research Methodology within the College of Education, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to this symposium. My special thanks to all of the individuals who have worked very hard to bring this to fruition. If you would, would the members of our planning committee please rise, Dr. Pratt and others, please rise, and so let's give them a round of applause. I especially want to thank the doctoral students that prepared this video that you have just seen. Um, all of these students work full time um, in various jobs across the university and in other post-secondary institutions throughout South Florida. And they prepared this actually as a part of a class project to research information about higher education issues and in facts. Their names are in the program, and would all of the students, masters and doctoral and other students that have worked with this program and are in our program, would you please rise so that we may acknowledge you as well. It is also my pleasure to acknowledge and to um, thank Dr. Diane Alprin, our provost. Thank you so much for your support and for your attendance, as well as Dr. Valerie Brister, who is our College of Education Dean. Thank you so much. Many other colleagues are listed in the program, um, and they will be introduced later. It is also important and fitting at this time that I thank many, many departments across our university that donated very various resources of your time as well as the pens and the other FAU uh, logo items. I'm not going to mention all of your names, um, but I do want to say that to all of our collaborators and supporters across the university, thank you very much for your support. I would also like to extend a very special welcome to Dr. Michael Schwartz, who is a retired president, President Emeritus of Cleveland State University, and a former FAU professor and a personal friend of Dr. Saunders, and welcome home to FAU. We are particularly pleased that this symposium is a part of the inaugural activities celebrating Dr. Mary Jane Saunders as the sixth president of Florida Atlantic University. We are pleased that today Dr. Saunders is joined by her husband, Dr. George Newcomb, a distinguished polymer scientist and chemistry research professor and we're delighted to have you join us today as well. Welcome. <laughs> Dr. Mary Jane Saunders became the sixth president of Florida Atlantic University earlier this year at the conclusion of a national search. She was appointed by a unanimous vote of the FAU Board of Trustees and confirmed by a statewide Board of Governors. Dr. Saunders is, comes to us to FAU from Cleveland State University, where she served successive, successively as Director of Biomedical and Health Institute, Founding Dean of the College of Science, and Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Her distinguished career also includes professional and academic appointments at the National Science Foundation, the Institute of Biomolecular Science at the University of South Florida, and she is an award-winning cell biology researcher, educator, 
an academic leader who is well known nationally for her commitment to public education. Dr. Saunders is an, is an accomplished researcher with both master's and doctoral degrees in botany from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She comes to FAU at a time when our university is just emerging as a center of world-class biomedical research in partnership with two international powerhouses, the Schripps Research Institute and the Max Planck Society. She is enthusiastic about FAU's growth potential in all areas, from arts and sciences to our young football team, which will soon have, as you can see from the video, a 30,000 seat um, uh, stadium on our campus that we can call our own. In her short time, Dr. Saunders has brought a sense of warmth and of openness, a willingness to listen, and of a strong belief that students are our most important business. We welcome you to our university. We share your beliefs and your commitments in our students. And we welcome you to this very fine institution, Dr. Saunders. Please join me in welcoming the sixth president of Florida Atlantic University, Dr. Saunders. Thank you so much and that video was wonderful and congratulations to the students who put it together and um, my husband George and I and Sherry Plymel can attest to all of those campuses and that 150 miles because this week we have been up and down the coast visiting every campus and participating in both inaugural and homecoming activities. We have a, a couple of special guests here today. Uh, Sherry Plymel is going to join us on the panel, and it's wonderful to see her here again, Sherry. She's holding up great. And we also have another trustee here, Trustee Anthony Barber, and trust the chair of the board of the trustees, Nancy Blosser. So if we would just welcome them. It They do a wonderful job for this university. You know, these are unpaid jobs with many, many hours associated with them. And these people really take their responsibility um, very, very much to heart and really make the best decisions for this university. So I thank them all for all of the time and energy they spend with us. And I tell you that until you sit in my shoes, stand in my shoes, walk in my shoes, you don't understand how much a board means to a public university. And we really thank them for their, for their efforts. We have another special guest here today, along with Mike Schwartz, who along with being a Dean of Social Science here, um, when I moved into my office, Mike called from Cleveland and said, what floor are you on? And I thought, well, why do you care what floor I'm on? And then he informed me that that administration building had been the College of Social Science, and he was on the second floor, and I'm quite sure your office looks just the same. <laughs> <laughs> We don't renovate administration buildings, so <laughs> you can visit it and feel, feel right at home. And another, uh, I think, wonderful fact about Mike is that he won um, Outstanding Teacher of the Year here at the university in, I think, 71 or 72. So not only was he a great administrator, he's also uh, a, a, a wonderful teacher here. And he's joined here by his wife, Joanne Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz, um, is, was a dean of a college of, of education at Kent State and is a well-known researcher on the gifted student and we're really pleased that she's joined us here today. This week as part of the um, inauguration, one of the things that I asked was that we incorporate a celebration of the university, that this week is not about me, it's really about the university and the accomplishments of the faculty and students. And I've been to all the symposia and they've just been wonderful. We had one on climate change here the other day that was very, very meaningful. 
We went up to the Jupiter campus and uh, 80 students presented undergraduate research posters and presentations and uh, works of art that was really terrific. Just this morning we were at our northernmost part of the campus, Harbor Branch, a new acquisition to the university and wonderful researchers up there talking about ocean exploration. And now the final symposium on uh, higher education issues in higher ed, I think really rounds out the, the academic symposia very well. Tomorrow, as part of the inauguration, we're going to have a uh, piece of music composed for the inauguration. And if you go back through the student union there, you'll get to see the installation, art installation, being installed right now. So then again, we celebrate every part of the university in this uh, inaugural week. I know you want to get to the um, topic of the symposia. I'd like to thank our, our special guests here, uh, Trustee Plymel, who will be on the panel, President Hanbury, and President Armstrong. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say as a, the new president in the bunch. And uh, I'll be taking notes. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, this is a wonderful week for me. Uh, I invite you all to both the installation ceremony tomorrow and the football game on Saturday. We need your help. We're not having a very good season, and we've got a stadium to fill. So we need lots of folks out there rooting for us. So thank you very much. I'm very, very proud to have been selected president of Florida Atlantic University, and I promise you I will work very, very hard on your behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saunders, for your words to all of us. My name is Diane Wright, Associate Professor of Higher Education Leadership in the Department of Educational Leadership and Research Methodology here at Florida Atlantic University. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our esteemed panel of higher education leaders and scholars. My introductions will be brief, so please refer to your program booklet for a more thorough summary of the accomplishments of each of these speakers. Dr. Floyd is no novice to any of us and to higher education or FAU. At FAU, Dr. Floyd served as the university faculty senator. She serves as chair of the College of Education and University Graduate Programs Committee, along with her responsibilities as professor and program leader of higher education. She has over 25 years of experience as an administrator in colleges and universities, including service as a community college president and vice president of student affairs. She has also served as a senior fellow with the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the board of directors of the American Association of Community Colleges, secretary of the American College Personnel Association, and is the past president of the Council for the Study of Community Colleges. She has published over 50 articles and books, including the only book to date about the community college baccalaureate movement. Dr. Floyd. Our second panelist, Dr. David J. Armstrong, is currently president of Broward College. He was the state chancellor of the Florida Community College System, now the Florida college system where community colleges were first approved to offer baccalaureate degrees. President Armstrong has provided extensive leadership in forming and developing partnerships with major businesses and organizations in the state, including Enterprise Florida, Workforce Florida, and the Florida Chamber of Commerce. He has a strong commitment to the development of bachelor's degree programs targeted to high demand critical shortage areas in Florida's workforce. President Armstrong has been a strong supporter of FAU's higher education leadership program by providing higher education leadership students with experiential campus-based opportunities through field projects, internships, and action research. 
Trustee Sherry Plymo is a charter member of the Florida Atlantic University Board of Trustees and is past chair of the board. She is also a member of the Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute and the Florida Atlantic University Foundation Board. She is also the past chair of the State Board of Community Colleges, a former chair of a former chief of staff of the Florida Department of Education and a former member of the St. Leo University Board of Trustees. Her accomplishments include numerous memberships and offices with local and state organizations that are devoted to education, community service, community improvement, and betterment. Dr. George Hanbury. Dr. Hanbury assumed the presidency of Nova Southeastern University on January the 1st, 2010, after serving 12 years as the executive vice president and chief operating officer at Nova Southeastern University. Prior to his years at Nova Southeastern University, Dr. Hanbury had an illustrious 30-year career in municipal administration working as the city manager in Fort Lauderdale, as well as Portsmouth and Virginia Beach, Virginia. He has been recognized nationally for his leadership and service by civic groups and organizations and has served on the boards of numerous civic and philanthropic organizations throughout the area. President Hanbury is the proud alumnus of Florida Atlantic University, having earned his PhD in public administration here at FAU. Today's moderator is Ann Mulder, visiting professor of higher education leadership here at Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Mulder has extensive teaching and administrative experience in higher education settings. She has served as a president of two community colleges as Dean of a College of Education in a regional university and as a consultant to numerous colleges, universities, and associations. She has also served on numerous national, state, and local boards, including the American Council on Education, the American Association of Community Colleges, the Council of North Central Community and Junior Colleges, and as an advisor, consultant, for the Kellogg Foundation's National Fellowship Program. We are pleased to have these educators with us today as we discuss the changing landscape of higher education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. It's always a little like listening to your obituary, isn't it, don't you think? <laughs> As uh, members of the audience, we're asking you to participate as well in this symposium in two ways. First of all, there's going to be time uh, for questions from the audience that will be provided to you. You have in your packet, those of you who received a packet, a three by five card, and if you can find it, um, you, we're, we're asking you to write your questions for the panel uh, on that three by five card, and you can hand it to the middle of the aisle uh, at the appropriate time. Now, if you do not have uh, one of those, would you hold your hands? If you can't find your three by five card, and one of our graduate students will come through right now and give you the card. So, um, make, sure you, make sure you think of a good, thoughtful question to ask the panel here at the end of the time. At the conclusion of um, uh, the um, presentation, we will make every effort to answer the questions that you are uh, uh, hoping to provide the uh, audience, uh, hoping to provide our panelists. Second, we want you to have the opportunity to give your good wishes to Dr. Saunders. There is a blank letter to the president inside your packet as well. Uh, we are encouraging you to write your own comments to the president on this form, nice ones, you know, nice comments. <laughs> we sincerely hope that you're going to do so, of course. There will be a, uh, uh, and nice things, we're going to check them all to make sure they are too, Dr. Saunders. Um, there's going to be a box at the reception, a bright blue box, where you can now put your letters uh, into this box so that we can pass them on to Dr. Saunders at the appropriate time. We'll also have additional form letters for any of you who may not have received the packets as well. And now for the logistics of the symposium itself. Each panelist will be given a brief period of time to respond to the opening question. The panel discussion is going to last approximately 30 minutes. 
And then there will be time for the moderated questions from the audience. That will be an additional 10 to 15 minutes following these initial presentations. We're going to then come back to the panelists for one final question. And following this and the concluding remarks and the summation, you will be invited to attend the reception in the pavilion right next door. So let us begin. So it's 1636 when Harvard University was chartered. The one constant in the higher education arena has been change. Arthur Cohen in his seminal work, The Shaping of American Higher Education, said it quite simply. The basic question in higher education have been debated since colleges began. What shall be taught? Who shall learn it? Who shall teach it? Who shall pay? Each question impinges on the other. Today's problems are related to yesterday's practice. And so it is with our first question to the panelists today. Question number one. The landscape of Florida's higher education system is changing, especially with the transition of community colleges to baccalaureate degree granting state colleges, with the growth of the for-profit college technological, uh, with the growth of the for-profit colleges, and with the technological advances in teaching. So what does this mean for the institutions represented here today? And what are the particular challenges that you see for higher education in Florida and in general? I'd like to begin with our distinguished alumni, Dr. Hanbury, and then follow with Trustee Plymel, then President Armstrong, and we'll come back to Dr. Floyd. So if we can begin. Thank you, Dr. Malda, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, President Santos. congratulations. We share certain things together. I was designated by the trustees as the sixth president of Nova Southeastern University. So toward that end, I was certainly humbly honored and privileged to receive that designation. Interestingly enough, however, I'm still the chief operating officer. Uh, Ray Ferrero Jr. is the chief executive officer, and until his contract expires this June, uh, he's the chancellor and chief executive officer. I'm the president and chief operating officer. So to some degree, you got ahead of me a little bit. And uh, Ray, oh, okay. <laughs> Ray will be giving his comments from the university tomorrow during your inauguration. Also, to those graduate students, the doctoral students who are working, I share your pain. I was a full-time city manager, held a job, and uh, FAU offered, at times and places, convenient to the student. Uh, the PhD program in public administration, I had my master's, and as a city manager, I didn't need more than a master's degree. But after 30 years, I often wondered what I was gonna do when I grew up. So I pursued the PhD program in the tower in downtown Fort Lauderdale. It was convenient for me to walk across the street and from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. on the weeknights and on weekends, I got a degree. Uh, now, I don't know if it's still required that seven years you have to have it done, but I was six and a half years, so. <laughs> I am real pleased to participate in this because as indicated, I've been a practitioner and also because of the doctorate I got from FAU. In the last 12 years, I've been able to teach graduate students who also are full-time employees in some occupation, either not-for-profits or in government, the skills and the art, bringing theory and practice together in public administration or economics and finance or leadership. It's been an exciting opportunity for me to be in the classroom and to be an academically credentialed practitioner. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. NSU, Nova Southeastern University, and FAU are very similar as far as age is concerned. In 1964, business leaders in Fort Lauderdale wanted to try to offer at times and places convenient to the student instead of sending them up to Gainesville or Tallahassee or even down south into Miami, 
opportunities to get their graduate degrees so that they could advance and keep the concept of lifelong learning in progress. So Nova Southeastern started on Las Olas Boulevard as a storefront. It didn't get its first students until 1967, and they were all PhD students. From those 17 PhD students that didn't graduate until 1970, we've now grown to 29,000 students. We don't have a football team, except for the Miami Dolphins, <laughs> and we are Division II NCAA. Primarily because of those 29,000 students, 80% are still pursuing the concept that those founding fathers started of Nova Southeastern University to offer, like FAU offered to me, at times and places convenient for the student to learn and to advance and to have their dreams and their aims above their reach accomplished. We feel very proud in that. And then in 1994, we were merged with Southeastern University of the Health Sciences, and that became Nova Southeastern University. So we are a relatively young university with 24,000 graduate and professional students in medicine, pharmacy, law, optometry, dentistry, nursing, psychology, and education. And interestingly enough, two of the individuals that are on your panel today were academically credentialed professors that taught in our School of Education, Dr. Mulder and Dr. Floyd. <laughs> we feel that those practitioners bring something to the classroom to encourage individuals to pursue theory so that practice and theory can come together. Now, to answer the question, and remember, I'm from Virginia, so I've got to build up a little story. So have, a, have, some, uh, have some faith in me here. And I wouldn't dare stop you. <laughs> in preparation for this, and, and really analyzing back in the last 30, 40 years, even since Nova Southeastern University uh, was created and, and FAU in 64. No kidding. In 1982, Derek Bach really published a book that people used as the seminal title book, Beyond the Ivory Tower, Social Responsibilities of the Modern University. Well, Dr. Book's thesis was at that time, in 1982 now, that universities should not abandon its role of where professors would be independent and their pursuit for knowledge for all things, and that they should not abandon that enclave where social responsibilities or deals or works with commercial enterprise caused compromise in the disinterested pursuit of knowledge and truth. It was Dr. Book's premise that to a university professor, this could indeed be the social integration and commercialization of academics could be its downfall. That was 1982. Bill Gates was only 25 years old. The internet wasn't there. And if you want to know what times have changed since 1982 to 2010, your graduate students put together a little ceremony or service called Did You Know? Google, which wasn't even invented when Dr. Book wrote his book. Google Did You Know? And you'll get a little three minute exercise of how rapidly technology has changed throughout the world. It's more people in China now that speak English than in the United States. It's more honor students honor students in India than there are students in the United States. We are indeed in a global economy, and times have changed for universities to be integrated into the community. And this university has just expressed that through Max Blanc, through Scripps, and how that integration is essential in a knowledge-based industry that educational institutions can indeed maintain that integrity 
through conflicts of interest and policies that administration puts together in conjunction with faculty and deans, you can maintain that independence, that scholarly activity for truth. But we must, we must, in a global economy, a knowledge-based industries, today's modern universities of the 21st century are replacing those land-grant universities and the concept of what they had in the 19th century of socially integrating the community and using the community as your laboratory for your students to do research, yet maintaining the academic independence of pursuing truth as Dr. Book proposed. Thank you for that thoughtful response, President Hanbury. Trustee Plymouth. Good afternoon, everyone. And I, I too would like to thank the students. Ah, thank you, David. Sorry. But you made a mess. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the students. They worked very hard on a real short timeline at, with the, um, their mentors, and they've done a wonderful job here today. I'm going to talk a little bit. I feel I consider myself a lifelong learner. I wish I had your accent. So smooth. Um, just, I'm going to talk a little bit about governance because governance is um, probably the thing about the higher education system that uh, that I have had the most experience with, and um, part of it's a little history lesson with what I think we need to do next. And uh, the and David remembers this vividly because I was the board chair when he was the chancellor. So today he's kind of my boss. <laughs> well, not exactly, but you you, you get it. The, re the restructure of higher education, the most recent restructure, I guess I should say, began in Florida in 1998 as a result of a constitutional amendment that was designed to uh, refine Florida's cabinet, which changed the, the position of the um, Commissioner of Education to Secretary of Education. And then the subsequent amendment of 2002 added a further nuance, some would say an avalanche, um, to higher education with the reestablishment of a state university system statewide board, which is called the Board of Governors. In the beginning, as they say of this restructure, all, all of education was to be governed by the Florida Board of Education. There was a very good reason for that, and that was so that the Board of Education could, could assure a continuum of readiness in Florida from every level of education to the next, be it pre-K to K, fifth grade to middle school, middle school to high school, high school, high school to the post-secondary. So it was a very laudable goal. I'm not sure they've achieved it yet. <laughs> but it, they had, they had um, in addition to that overarching policy board in that original thought, were the local boards for community colleges, and that was the establishment of um, the University Board of Governors, Board of, Re uh, Board of Trustees. At that time, in that restructure, the Board of Regents and the State Board of Community Colleges were dissolved. That was 2001. Community colleges already had local boards, so they were well established in the way they governed themselves. But the university first boards were seated in June and July of 2001. Uh, two of us original board members here are to, here today. And then a political collision, which we've all seen in Florida over a lot, of, a lot of things, erupted before this new system ever really got going. Senator Graham, who when he was governor had established the Board of Regents, was not real happy with the whole idea of no Board of Regents. So the 2002 amendment was conceived and passed by a very narrow margin in 2002. Now, under our yet newer system, newer yet system, we have local boards for community colleges, state colleges, and universities, but only one statewide policymaking board, the Board of Governors, and they only govern the public universities. So the state and com community colleges are still governed by the Board of Education, which I would suggest to you has way too much on its plate. Go back to that, make everybody ready, go from level to level, that's pretty tough. And so I would suggest that the community colleges might be ready for a state board of community colleges again. You should file that bill. <laughs> I'm not in a place to file that bill. <laughs> 
But I bet you noticed in that little, um, those couple of paragraphs, a new term crept up in my last paragraph, and that was state colleges. The first baccalaureate at a community college was approved in 1999 when a university, who will remain nameless, <laughs> refused to provide access to education and nursing in a very remote part of their service region. And the concept of workforce baccalaureate degrees began in Florida. And thus, my opinion, the slippery slope of where we are today. I also must say that one university wasn't real cooperative, but all the state universities were in fact enablers to this because community colleges for years, I would say, David, I'm sure will back me up, we have begged the universities to articulate baccalaureates with the AS degrees and we had very little success or collaboration. So in late 2006, now we have a board of, now we're back to a board of governors, which is essentially the old board of regents. They commissioned the Pappas Report to study the restructuring of higher ed in Florida, which among other things clearly stated that Florida did not produce enough baccalaureate, baccalaureate degrees. Well, the community colleges were perfectly postured to step up to this plate and like dominoes began to offer a, a wider array of workforce baccalaureates than the original education in nursing. And that really was the beginning of what is now the de facto new tier of higher education in Florida. Later, it was set in stone by the Florida legislature a couple years ago, two or three years ago. I, I believe that one of our challenges as we move into this new world of higher education and the new way of technology and all the other things, but is to ferret through these ambiguities in oversight and leadership. We have, the, we have to assure quality, not just quantity. We have to avoid duplication in services and programs. We have to assure a continuum of education from the baccalaureate through the masters to the PhDs. The current business model and financial formulas need to address this. We have to collaborate and form partnerships with our communities that we serve and with the economic development councils and agencies in our, reason, in our regions. We have hard questions facing us. We all have to learn from each other. Universities need and want to preserve their integrity as great centers of thinking and learning. Community colleges and state colleges need to preserve their vital mission that has served them so well since their inception. We need to compete but we need to collaborate. Workforce degrees are here. We need to assure students who have workforce degrees an avenue to even higher learning. Not a guarantee, but an articulation. We need to think always about the need to re redefine ourselves and the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Pimel. And President Armstrong. See if I can avoid making another mess up here. <laughs> Thank you very much, and President Saunders, welcome. We are thrilled to have you here. Uh, as soon as I got the word, I think the day that, that uh, Nancy and Sherry and their colleagues appointed you, I somehow got access to your cell phone, and you have picked up the phone and welcomed you, uh, and it's been great to have you on board, and uh, we're looking forward to even greater partnerships between Broward College and FAU in the future. Uh, based on great relationships we've had for many years and relationships we have with Nova Southeastern and that we also enjoy to our south because we're sitting between Dade County and here. Uh, we enjoy similar partnerships with another university called Florida International University. And so uh, we are frankly considered these two universities in the public sector and I think our university with a private university, the model for partnership and it uh, is a great testimony to the wonderful work that's been done by presidents before us, boards of trustees, uh, many people who are sitting in this audience who have built a wonderful partnership. Chair Blosser, uh, thank you for having us here. She's a neighbor in Fort Lauderdale and looks after FAU and Broward County and Sherry and I, as she's already said, go way back. And uh, so I am uh, very dedicated to, even with our growing mission and expanding mission, continuing to build on the tremendous partnership that we have between our, universe, between our two institutions. And uh, Sherry just alluded to one way that we can go about doing that in addition to many others. Uh, when people come to Davie, Florida and come onto our educational complex and they see FAU's presence on our campus, by the way, it was our campus that leased to FAU. <laughs> and there is a lease there. 
uh, that we would like to maintain for many years uh, because it gives phenomenal opportunity for our students. And people who visit us consider us a model. And I want it to not only continue, but I want it to grow and enhance in many ways. And that's happening because of the Board of Trustees and the administration and the faculty here at FAU continuing to commit resources that are scattered like no other place. I don't know how you do it. I know my friend Joy Ann Stevens is in the room somewhere. There she is. Uh, she does a fabulous job representing you for many years with her colleagues in Fort Lauderdale, but now all over the place. And I think her two-year-old Prius has 60 plus thousand miles on it. Uh, and that's one little testimony to how big your district is, and thank goodness you're here. Uh, you know, both of our institutions are great reflections of the evolving nature of higher education in this community. Uh, Phyllis, I see you back there too. Phyllis Pepco does a great job downtown with us as a partner. Uh, I see that FAU is established in 1961. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary at Broward College this year, the first public institution in Broward County. Um, we're very young. We're very young, and we've come a long way. We'll have 65,000 students at Broward College this year. You've got a lot of students here because I couldn't find a parking space except for you reserving one for me. Thank you. Um, and yet we're evolving. Uh, Nancy, I think you and the Board of Trustees just a year or two ago spent a lot of time on a major strategic plan, and I applaud you and admire you for being bold and looking at uh, new programs that uh, are quite expensive but will set this institution uh, in a different, already has, set this institution in a different direction for the future. And Sherry, I agree, we need to be careful about replicating and duplicating programs, but sometimes I guess you need another medical school, right? No matter how expensive. <laughs> Yours was there first, and so whoever came second. Now, now, David. <laughs> or whoever followed. <laughs> Uh, I guess, you know, those things we do have to look at. But I think that our two institutions are also reflective and evolving because they are attempting to respond to the needs of our community. They're attempting to respond, we are, and I think you are too, responding to the needs of your students, your business and economic development community. Uh, I'm the new chair of the Economic Development Alliance in Fort Lauderdale, and when we're recruiting businesses, after we talk about taxes and after we talk about how many incentives we're going to put on the table to bring and recruit them here, they want to know what the prepared workforce is and how we can respond to that and how you as great students and graduate students and professionals uh, can help them be able to meet their needs. So uh, that's where I think we start. Uh, and, and so we will continue to evolve. This institution looks nothing like it did 30 years ago. My younger, wiser, smarter, better looking, brother, Mike Armstrong, who is a great friend of all of you here at this institution. Mike Armstrong and I worked together 25 years ago in Tallahassee on planning issues before there was ever any FAU in Broward County. And people wanted FAU to be in Broward County, and we worked with policymakers and others to help make that happen to respond to the community. We will continue to evolve as community colleges have over the years and as universities have. I, I don't remember when, but FAU at one time was just upper division, right? Mm -hmm. And so your mission has evolved and evolved and will continue to evolve, and ours will as well. But if we stay focused on students and what the needs are, and in my opinion, the needs of our community in a larger way, business and industry and others to help um, prepare their workforce for great careers. That's a mutually beneficial uh, goal and mission for us both to have. And on top of that, we'll continue to work together to make sure our students have seamless articulation, two plus two system, those things that have been long-standing principles that have helped both of our systems be great and have helped our students be able to succeed. Thank you again and welcome, Dr. Saunders. Thank you, President Armstrong. Dr. Floyd. Thank you. Um, colleagues, these are wonderful uh, comments, and I agree with you on the community being our laboratory, the issues of, of governance, the importance of, of teasing that out, as well as the pathways and partnerships. 
and a conversation about our curriculum and what we're really doing with workforce education and in other avenues. I'd like to focus my comments on the landscape in three, in three points and three challenges that I believe not only are important for us here in South Florida, but are also important for us um, nationally. <clears throat> The first is that, and piggyback on uh, uh, Trustee Plymouth's comment, is that I, I believe that we really need to have some serious conversations about the ramifications of community colleges offering baccalaureate degrees, what kinds of degrees are being offered, and what that actually means for us. What that means for us regarding graduate education. Um, we, we need, as you had suggested, to have a conversation about articulating those degrees. And I know that's not easy because change is, 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 is difficult in colleges and universities, but it's nevertheless very, very important and it's not just an issue in Florida. There are over 40 states in this country where universities are offering technical baccalaureate degrees and in many of the states this is an issue that has been been articulated and that that other um, foundations the Gates Foundation and Lumina Foundation are also quite quite interested in the question I have is where will the graduates of these um, uh, uh, programs go the graduates of the Bachelor of Technology the Bachelor of Assign of, of Applied Science of Applied Technology those in engineering technology those that that would have a degree in hospitality management those are you and I are Virginia Tech alum I'm very proud to be a Hokie and from Virginia Tech and I believe very strongly that that engineering is a solid and strong while it's a technical degree it is also a very honorable degree as are medicine as are a law as are a number of other disciplines that many of these colleges are are engaging in so I I guess I guess the question that I have that is a question that is being addressed across the country is that we really need to have an aligned system of higher education where we are um, uh, looking at career pathways, where we're providing opportunities for credentialing in ways that are very meaningful, from associate degrees or certificates, whatever those might be, baccalaureate degrees, in whatever we call them, if it's a BS in hospitality management or a BAT, it's a hospitality management degree. And what that means, very importantly, for us in graduate education, and I think that that is a huge issue for us in our tick because we have our own biases of we what we think about articulating these, these technical degrees. Secondly, in terms of higher education and what I believe are issues um, facing us, not only in Florida, but across the country the area of technology you mentioned a book in the 1980s um, George, uh, 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 John Nesbitt's book on megatrends many of us remember uh, that book and his conversation with us about the high-tech high-touch piece and the importance of that uh, we are living that era now um, we, with the internet and the like and all of the technology. So how do we ensure that we are utilizing technology in a way that it is actually enhancing learning, that we are um, uh, uh, providing support systems for our students that are ensuring that they are successful? And I think that we can borrow from, we certainly have some, have some things here at FAU to be proud of, but, but one of the uh, programs that I read about in the Chronicle the other day that intrigued me was one from South Orange Community College, which is a Sherpa program. You know, like you have those guides that help you up Mount Amherst. I've never been, but you know the drill. And in and, um, and, and te technological ways of of um, linking the, the student who is a new student, you know how you get ads when you're on the internet and you have the pop-ups? The pop-up that says, you're a new student and here's a link to our online orientation program. Or here's a link to this program and then we can go to, to other places, maybe even pick up the phone and we get a live body. So a way that we have some blended opportunities of ensuring that our students are successful. Those students that have a high grade point, maybe an automatic way that they are contacted through 
this social media piece of, of we have honors programs here at the university or at the college and so forth and so on even to the point of our registration opens around the mid of no, uh, November those that don't register early then you get an automatic notice hey notice that your courses in engineering technology are filling quickly you better come in and register so we need to in my opinion across the country and in other avenues, we, we need to really be open to, to not only thinking differently about technology, but using those tools in ways that we're actually reaching markets um, that are effective. I, I'm going to go back to this high tech, high touch uh, piece because I think that it's very important that while the Sherpa program or others that we might use technology to help advance what we're doing um, there is absolutely nothing that takes the place of a human being a human person um, across uh, uh, the hall from me is um, an, an office assistant her name is Sophia bless her heart she's back there working today and I listen to her every day. I listen to her pleasant voice when someone gets lost in our FAU system and gets a dead end and can't find something. Um, you know, we have a lot of forms. We have a lot of systems. A lot of people do. We have a lot of complications regarding getting financial aid and issues. And she is extraordinarily pleasant. She is a problem solver, she's a helper. More importantly, she encourages and she provides that high touch piece that is ever so important. So I think that it's not only important that we look at administrators providing that piece and of course faculty and the co my colleagues that are here, I applaud and I truly believe that the research is accurate, that it is what we do as faculty, that personal touch um, that we do with our students that makes um, a huge difference. But I also wanted to have a shout out for our staff, for those that have made a huge difference in my life, um, secretaries and um, custodians and folks that have set this room up, that paying attention to that very one student, that one student of that encouragement, we can all think of someone that did that in our lives, that that makes a true difference. And finally, I want to end my comments on what I think um, uh, we're facing in the cha changing landscape of higher education, is a resistance to change. Um, the, we're naturally resistant to change as human beings, but higher education colleges and universities, we are very, very slow to change in many avenues. Absent from this table today is the non the, the for profits, the proprietary institutions. Not absent from this room. We have students in our program that are, are leaders within the proprietary institutions. I believe that we cannot, nor should we, deny the importance of these institutions in the academic marketplace. I believe while there may be a few bad apples, and I'm not defending those bad apples, I do believe that many proprietary institutions are indeed providing skills and training in an array of areas that are not being met. We are at no risk in Florida of over-educating our population. <laughs> They would not, many of them would not, they would not be in this business if there was not a market. So it, it, it comes to this piece of what can we afford and who's going to pay for it. What can we afford at the local level? What can we afford at the state and the natural? And it, and it, is, it, is, it is a complex issue. There are a lot of complex issues in higher education. But in closing, I believe that we are in, we're searching for a new normal. And I believe that that discussion will, will continue with a search for a new normal. I just encourage us as we do this to ensure that we have as many stakeholders in this issue as possible around uh, the, the table for that conversation. Thank you.
You all have presented some very interesting challenges here. The question of the social integration in a knowledge-based society that uh, President Hanbury discussed, the issues of governance and restructuring that uh, Trustee uh, Plymel spoke to, uh, spoke to uh, the whole issue of partnerships and evolving mission uh, that uh, President Armstrong spoke to, and Dr. Floyd's very important comments on archit articulating the baccalaureate with the uh, Bachelor of Technology and Applied Tech that's coming, aligning our system, if you will, with career pathways, high tech, high touch, and of course this issue of the resistance to change. So let me, um, let me come back to this question. How do we create an academy? What, what do we need to do to create an academy that uh, uh, welcomes change? Um, any questions, comments on that? Well, first of all, I'd like to expand on Dr. Floyd's comments as well as Mr. Armstrong's. I think collaboration is going to have to be essential. In the last three years, We've experienced the deepest and longest recession this nation has seen since the Great Depression. We must, in all areas of the academy, collaborate and leverage and work so that we don't create and duplicate efforts. Articulation agreements are essential. And I think assessment <laughs> is not just a new phrase, it will be a phrase that will work with all of us for years to come. Whether we want to receive grants, whether we want to receive state or federal funds, or whether we want our students to come to a private not-for-profit university such as Nova Southeastern University. Students, legislators, community members, scientists, researchers, companies are going to want to know what type of data do you have? What type of assessment outcome measurements have you done? Where are we going and how are we going to get there? I'm glad Dr. Uh, Floyd brought up the for-profits. I think every area, and the for-profits have capitalized on things that you mentioned. They have addressed educational activities that were abandoned by other sources, whether it was military personnel, workers who had full-time jobs, a single parent, uh, the, uh, the young couple that was needed to work and stay at home but yet offer education on times and places. I think sometimes we've forgotten what some of our earlier uh, leaders got us into. But outcome measurements are going to be essential. The Department of Education is concerned, and you read the paper lately about the for-profits that are offering education and encouraging debt to students for jobs and careers, talk about outcome measurements, that pay less than maybe minimum wage mm -hmm. for $100,000 worth of loan. Now, I think that's unconscionable. We are indeed a not-for-profit at Nova Southeastern University. But like any not-for-profit, we have to have a margin in order to have any kind of a mission, just as you do, Dr. Saunders, in a public institution. And accountability is going to be something you're going to hear more of. So for that effort, we're seeing more of yield rates, retention rates, graduation rates, but more importantly today, placement rates. What kind of jobs did the student get? Law passage rates, licensure passage rates. And then what happens to them after that? So data gathering is something that possibly professors, administrators at universities have not been used to, but we're all going to have to be used to if, indeed, we want to say that our mission is noble, and I truly feel it is. As a private not-for-profit, I feel that's where we are distinguished sometimes between the four profits. We feel like we share the same partnership that Mr. Armstrong mentioned. We offer scholarships to students at Broward College. They put up half a million, we put up a half a million, a million dollars worth of scholarships for Broward College students who wish to pursue some of those graduate programs that I mentioned. We have articulation agreements with all the community colleges in the state of Florida as well as the independent colleges and universities. What we want to try to do, however, is to ensure that that same noble purpose 
that I mentioned, that Dr. Bach pursued in 1982. We have not forgotten, you have not forgotten, the noble purpose of educating people and following and said scholarly studies to find the truth wherever that may lead us. I feel strongly about that. And as such, our margins at Nova Southeastern are shy south of a little less than 5%. The for-profit universities talk about margins of 15 to 35%. Now, that is interesting, but I heard Dr. Saunders talk about our primary goal just like Nova Southeastern Universities, is student-centered. All the money that comes into Nova Southeastern University, other than that small margin, is plowed back either in research, in the classroom, in the faculty, faculty development, or scholarships. Toward that effort, we don't have stockholders. We don't worry about dividends, and we don't worry about return other than the return on investment for accounting purposes. So I think every university, public, private, not-for-profit, and even the for-profits, Dr. Floyd, have a place of offering education. But all of us, all of us, for-profit, not-for-profit, and public, are going to have to show students and faculty and those stakeholders, whether they're stockholders or taxpayers or tuition, that the money that I'm putting up is worth the value of the education I'm getting. That's a very timely comment. This morning they were talking on the news about uh, the increasing cost of attending college for our students. Uh, 7,500, I think, a year for the public and something like $27,000 is the average for uh, uh, the uh, private institutions. So the question really is, how do we make colleges affordable for these students that we're talking about as well? That that's, do we need a new financial paradigm? Uh, I, that's just a question here. Would that be something, a new way of, a new way of investing and funding higher education? Uh, is such a thing desirable? Does anyone have a comment on that? And by the way, while we are taking the comment, we'll start uh, g gathering the questions from the audience, if they will. Rivka, uh, the uh, students here, if you can gather the questions. Anyone want to talk about a financial paradigm here? Well, I, I will say, I think in some ways, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I think at least from the state perspective of the financing, we do need, we have, now we have a multitude of systems. We are going to have to look at the way it fi it, it's financed. When we have workforce degrees that are pr producing baccalaureate degrees in education, nursing, a whole incredibly needed degrees needed for our workforce but the university it, we can't we really can't I don't believe can compete with what the community or the state colleges can produce in the in at that level but at the same time we have to be producing the universities doctors of nursing masters of nursing because um, those are the teachers but we, it, the financial model, that we, the business model that we now have, we need those undergraduates to help us support the masters and the doctoral level. So somebody, it's, it can't just be us, by the way, because we can have all the answers, but we need to make other people know the answers. <laughs> Don't we, David? Some sort of strategic plan, if you will, the aligning of the whole educational enterprise in the state of Florida, then, as well, an example. I think, it, I, th I think you can't just decide you're going to have a new system. You have to look at the financial model for that system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were already, I think, um, I think part of the problem, even back when I was on the State Board of the Community Colleges, talking about the, the number of students that could go through the AS program was relying on the number of um, nurses that had master's degrees to exactly. teach it. So, and they came from the university. So, the, you know, the university can't do just master's. They can't do just doctoral. Everybody has the role. Without the, the business model of those, um, the baccalaureate nurses. And I think there's a many, many examples of that, but nursing is pretty easy to, for everybody to Pretty understand. easy to so, see, exactly. Yeah, I think it needs to be looked at. Exactly. Rivka, do you have a question? Doctoral students will be sharing.
colleges, state colleges, and public and private universities to help our students retain through graduation towards gainful employment. So it's not even anymore about how many students can we bring in to our institutions, but how can we help them succeed and as um, some of our panelists were discussing, um, succeed towards gainful employment, employment that does pay more than, than a living wage, that, that enables in, increased quality of life. And this so desperately impacts the American economy today. What are some specific examples that you have seen in Florida institutions, particularly your own if you could share, that help improve um, and meet uh, the President's challenge and help improve retention rates and graduation rates towards gainful improvement for our students? Uh, let me make a couple of quick comments on a couple of things discussed before. I, I want to weigh in and support George and um, all the other panelists on collaborative efforts and several good examples have been used. But the very issue we're discussing right now is another good example. Uh, our institution is growing rapidly as are other state colleges and community colleges and we desperately need graduate programs even for our support. I think I've got at least three graduate students who work for me sitting in the audience today. And I've, I've got some applications, uh, David. <laughs> <laughs> and we have many who are at Nova Southeastern as well across the street and some down the street to the south at FIU. Uh, but uh, I know Lorik Valzor. Uh, Lorik, are you still in here? He's our honors coordinator, a wonderful longtime faculty member in the PhD program here with uh, our wonderful host here, uh, Morella Baker. Mel, where, where are you? There you are. She's a sociology professor and does fabulous work for us. And of course, Laura Anzac is our enrollment management director and she's doing tremendous work for her. They are examples of, I think, if I've got the numbers right, uh, somewhere around 35 uh, staff that we're paying the tuition on to continue their education, whether they're entry level staff seeking a bachelor's degree here but also faculty members who are seeking to improve themselves and add to their disciplines through masters and PhD. And so education is one of the few growing businesses in the world right now, in America, especially education and healthcare, I think. And all of our institutions are very involved in that. And so supporting each other in the workforce we have there is important. And I hope gainful employment is not an issue in those areas. I don't think it is. We all would love to have more salaries, but guess what? We got jobs. Every one of you probably got a job, I hope. Uh, you got excellent benefits if you work at FAU or Broward College, unparalleled. You get a lot of time off, and we shouldn't take that for granted, especially when we got 11 or 12% unemployment rate out there. So um, gainful employment, though, is a big issue. And I applaud George for the comments he made. Today, the Obama administration is releasing most of the rules uh, they'll be put out, gainful employment one is not going to be released, I guess, until January or February, one of the most controversial parts of the whole um, consumer protection, I like to call it, legislation. Uh, I agree with other panelists that the for-profit sector uh, does some good things, uh, but I believe that it needs to be regulated. Uh, when I have 250, a list of 250 students trying to enroll with us this fall, who are setting on debt and that they're in default in with federal debt that will follow them to the grave even if they go to a bankruptcy court and have every other debt cleared from them it'll follow them to the grave and they don't have a degree and they don't have a job and they're begging Laura to find a way to give them financial aid or enroll them in the college and we can't what's going to happen to those people and that's a small minority of the issue that we are dealing with here. Uh, listen, I'm all for the American dream, free enterprise system, people making a buck and everything else, but 35% uh, profit margins are, when it's financed by you and you and you, backed by federal loans <coughs> that uh, add to our federal debt. So there's issues there that need to be addressed, and I'm thankful that Congress is addressing them. Now I forgot the question. <laughs> that was a great answer, though. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, persistence. And uh, look, I was on the phone two hours with the Gates Foundation this morning, which has become great partners of ours in higher education. Thank goodness Warren Buffett threw billions at Gates and said, let's do great things. And they're doing lots of great things all over the world. Education is one of those. Um, 
Lorik could tell you about students in his classrooms who come from 150 different nations of origin in Broward College's 65,000 student body, and you have something similar here, I'm sure. They come with cultural differences. They come speaking French Creole, Portuguese. Uh, they come, in a lot of cases, better prepared in mathematics than students who've just graduated from high school right here. That should wake us up. But they have education, um, they have language issues that we try to work with them to help them get over. Most of them are from low income, many of them are from low income backgrounds, but boy do they have um, ambition. Their families in many cases brought them here for the American dream that maybe some of us have forgotten about. And so some of our best students that end up coming to you or going off to NYU or wherever they want to go, go through Lorix honors program and get an AA degree with us. Uh, two quick examples uh, we honored last year. We've had more Jack Kent Cook scholarship award recipients uh, for community college students who have an AA degree. They then are handed $30,000, 50 around the nation every year. We've had more than any other college. Uh, they can go anywhere they want. They have open admission to wherever they want and they go places. Uh, most of them don't stay here. I wish more of them would. But one called me, uh, two graduated last year. We had two in the same class. One was from Peru, one was from Brazil. Both young women, both are enrolled in Northeastern universities now. So the one who went to NYU in information technology, brilliant young woman from Peru, um, called me and said, I've got a problem. I got a tough choice to make. I have three options in front of me for uh, internships this summer. One is with Credit Suisse, one is with, um, one is with Goldman Sachs, and the other one is with Google. I said, you really have a problem, you know. <laughs> she's finishing this term at NYU and she's going to work for Credit Suisse. Uh, so we, we have the best and we have the most challenged. Some of the most challenged are kids coming right out of our high schools, didn't take Algebra II, they're going straight into remedial programs at Broward College. So we've got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of programs in place and I could spend hours talking, I'd spent two hours telling the Gates Foundation about it this morning with strategies that we have that we uh, do a lot of research on and tracking and we see the results of that. In fact, I applaud again the graduate class with Dr. Floyd, Dr. Mulder this year did an action research project for us, Dr. Saunders, and came in and met with our team and came and delivered a very professional report I wish that, uh, well, you would wish that they could be uh, for pay consultants because I would have paid big money for the results that they and gave you, us. They did a fabulous yeah. job. <laughs> <laughs> and I do it in the form of supporting their tuition to continue school here and we'll continue to. Uh, it's actually not too late. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, just, that's just another great example of the partnerships we have and, and continuing those professional relationships with and I would suggest as Sherry noted very well and Debbie backed up, as we continue to develop programs that are going to need opportunities for students to go into graduate school, we need to continue to get our faculties together. Uh, we need the engineering department here on the, the faculty here talking to our folks in information technology and others so that we can work through and make sure we have alignment of curriculum and educational standards. Hopefully I hit the question somewhere there. I apologize. I'm Thank you. We have time for only one more question from the audience, but we're going to collect these questions and Dr. Floyd, Dr. Wright and I will put them together and uh, attempt to talk with our students and uh, bring forth some sort of responses that we can give back to those of you that are interested. Uh, just another little project for us, but I think that's a fair thing for us to be able to offer you, President Saunders, and the rest of you for your thoughtful attendance today. So we have one more question here? Sure. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I'll go, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, and this was directed to the state colleges, but I think it can be answered by any of you up there. Um, will the state colleges have the resources to attract the very best faculty, i.e. the salaries, course schedules, the opportunity and resources for research that will enrich their instruction, or will there be a different kind of faculty community? Good question. <laughs> Somewhere in there, all there's a bunch of deans who ought to answer this question. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Does well, he, doesn't that point out where um, collaboration has to be? Too? Absolutely. The more the more collaboration between the faculties, 
to work that out as, as the state colleges grow and prosper? Surely. I think that's a good, Dr. Dr. Floyd? Just quickly, because even, I know Lurick, you probably had a question too, but that, that's an issue that is, that is being addressed across the country in other states where this is occurring and the fear that, that we will have a two-tiered faculty that we will have the faculty in the community colleges that are paid at a higher salary that are delivering the baccalaureate programs vis-a-vis -vis those that are in the lower division. And, and, and the jury is still out on how that's sorting out, but the, the data that we've collected through our research say that that has not happened, that there have been intentional efforts in a number of states to ensure that there are one faculty. And that is, in fact, the case at Broward College. We purposefully, intentionally design one faculty, same teaching load, scholarship is important. Uh, there are requirements that we follow very closely that those faculty who are teaching in the bachelor's level program, uh, that we all are held to the same exact standards by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, every institution that's involved in this conversation at least, um, that requires that I believe it is a minimum of 25 percent of the courses taught by PhD at the upper mm -hmm. division level. and. You know, fortunately, because of our great partnership and a fabulous faculty that we have at Broward College, we well exceed that in all the program areas that we're going into. But we have one faculty, they're on the pay, same pay schedule. Uh, you know, one day maybe we'll talk about performance pay in education, but we haven't gotten to that in higher education apparently. President Obama has strongly uh, incented that in the K-12 arena, and that's going to be an ongoing interesting conversation for us all to watch that will probably drag us into the conversation whether we want to be there or not. But other than that, we're one faculty on the same pay scale. Thank you. Well, thank you. We could certainly continue on, but uh, there is one final question uh, that we really need to address today. But I want to thank you, first of all, for your insight on the changing landscape of higher education. But this last uh, question, I think, is a very timely one, considering the fact of uh, Dr. Saunders' inauguration. What advice do you have for Dr. Saunders as the new president of Florida Atlantic University? Get a healthy car allowance from your board. <laughs> I hope they provided you with that already. Our chauffeur would be more appropriate. Uh, no, I, I, you're going to find great partners here, and uh, please stay in, I have no doubt you already have shown in your limited time here that you're going to continue the great partnerships that have already existed between our institutions, and don't hesitate to call on us for support and help in any way. Well, I just want to say we're so glad she's here. And I've I had an opportunity this week to really watch, and actually all through the summer, because I was um, the chairing the inauguration. And um, my advice would be to never lose your easy, outgoing manner, and how you combine that with your giant ability to sort through all these complex issues is amazing to me. But I hope you never lose that, because it's so valuable to us. Thank you. Well, I've already told Dr. Saunders I think she could give me advice instead of me providing any. As, as I've already stated, my investiture was several months off. Hers is tomorrow. So uh, the, the concept of advice is to a president. Today's university president has to be far more involved than 1982. By that, I'm talking about not just with faculty, not just with the deans, and not just with alumni or going to football games, but with the community, and with the legislators, and with lobbyists, and with, you name it, potential donors. Uh, today's university president is almost like a preacher. The handout saying, you know, we've got a major noble cause here, and we want you to give with your time and your talent and your gifts. Uh, boards of trustees are expecting university presidents to raise money, not just to be scholars and not just to emphasize community involvement and town and gown. The multiple hats that your president wears are huge. Toward that effort, I hope all of you give your support and your advice to your president. She will need it. Your guidance will be essential. As far as any advice, President Saunders, 
the only thing that I can do as far as advice goes on leadership is from my old city manager days. And that is two things. One thing that goes back as far as, uh, as the Greeks, and that is know thyself, the Oracle of Delphi. You've heard that. And then the second thing is a popular book by Covey, Seek First to Understand Before Being Understood. Those two things, and from these seminars and from what I've already heard, I know Ray Ferrero, my predecessor, and the person that I will succeed, has already offered opportunities for Nova Southeastern and FAU to work together. I want to carry on that offer, and anything we can do to see you succeed, we want to help you do. So thank you. Madam President, we welcome you. And we know that we're gonna be finding our new normal as we go through change. We know that. Um, my advice is keep doing what you're doing. Walking around, listening, developing systems so that all of our stakeholders and our university community and family can feel a part. That's how we feel the buy-in. That's how we feel that we're heard. And I thank you for for that piece. The second piece, which is probably more important than the first, is to keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the prize about what really matters in education, and that's our students. Thank you, and welcome. To our esteemed panelists, thank you for your participation in this timely discussion. To our audience, thank you so much for your thoughtful attention. To the students, all of you who are in this room today, those who participated and those who are from our classes, thank you so much for your contribution to our life. To Dr. Saunders, our warm congratulations and heartfelt support. Dr. Saunders, when Diana Chapman Walsh, the former president of Wellesley College, was asked to select a poem that spoke to her belief about leadership, she selected William Stafford's work, Silver Star. And I want to leave you with this excerpt. If you are lucky, people will give you a dignified name, and they will bring crowds to admire how sturdy you are, how long you can hold still for the camera. And sometime, they say, if you last long enough, you will hear God. A voice will roll down from the sky, and all of your patience will be rewarded. The whole world will hear it. Well done. The very best to you, Dr. Saunders. You're all invited to the reception. Please don't forget to write your letters to Dr. Saunders and join me in a round of applause for this illustrious panel and for this